Einen wunderschönen guten Abend und sehr herzlich willkommen hier im Kino im Deutschen Filmmuseum zu unserer Reihe Lecture und Film, die Sie seit Beginn des Wintersemesters im November und noch bis Ende des Sommersemesters im Juli unter dem Titel Die Revolution findet trotzdem statt, dem Kino und den Filmen von Pierre Paolo Pasolini widmet. Und es ist uns eine sehr, sehr große Freude, dass gleich drei Frankfurter Institutionen der Goethe-Universität mitwirken, dass diese Reihe zustande kommt. Und ich begrüße sehr, sehr herzlich Luca, Ciam äh, Cam Caminati, Entschuldigung, Luca Caminati, den Referenten des heutigen Abends. Die Reihe beinhaltet ja, wie Sie wissen, mehrere Lectures, aber auch Filme, die wir jeweils im Anschluss zeigen. Herzlich willkommen and a warm welcome to you. Nach der Lecture und der Vorführung der Filme gibt es wie immer im Anschluss ein ausführliches Gespräch, bei dem Sie gerne auch Fragen an den Referenten richten können. Und äh, Lecture und Film finden, wie angekündigt, in englischer Sprache statt. Die Filme, allesamt 16 mm Kopien, eine davon sogar eine sehr seltene Zweibandkopie, stammen aus dem Archiv des Arsenals in Berlin und sind leider nicht in dem Zustand, den wir bislang in unseren Veranstaltungen gewohnt waren. Doch wir wollen Ihnen diese, diese nicht vorenthalten und haben uns deswegen entschlossen, sie trotzdem zu zeigen. Es sind Filme, die in der Originalfassung laufen. Wie gesagt, eine davon als Zweibahnkopie. Von, beiden, äh, von zwei der drei Filme werden die Untertitel live hinten eingespielt, die englischen Untertitel. Und ein herzliches Dankeschön dafür an unsere beiden Vorführer, Christian Appelt und Michael Besser. Es wird deswegen auch zwischen den, zwei, äh, zwischen den drei Filmen eine kleine Pause jeweils geben, zwei, drei Minuten ungefähr, bis die Filme wieder jeweils neu eingelegt worden sind. Bevor ich jetzt an Marc Siegel übergebe, der Ihnen äh, äh, Luca Caminati noch vorstellen wird, möchte ich Sie noch kurz auf unser, auf, auf unser thematisches Begleitprogramm hinweisen. Immer Mittwoch um Samstags um 18 Uhr zeigen wir in unserer Lecture Filmreihe Filme, die den Blick auf Pasolinis Schaffen erweitern sollen. Am 28. Januar zeigen wir unter dem Motto Pasolinis Frauen Stanley Kramers Film The Secret of Santa Vittoria, Anna Magnanis Ausflug nach Hollywood aus dem Jahr 1969, Ewe und dann im Februar, Klassiker des italienischen Kinos zum Thema Mafia und Gewalt in den 60er und 70er Jahren widmen. Darunter sind Werke unter anderem von Damiano Damiani, Lina Wertmüller und den im Januar leider verstorbenen Francesco Rosi. Alle Filme lohnen sich sehr und ich ähm, freue mich oder würde mich sehr freuen, wenn Sie da auch unser Gast wären. Jetzt wünsche ich Ihnen sehr viel Vergnügen und einen interessanten Abend und begrüßen Sie nun herzlich Marc Siegel und im Anschluss dann Luca Caminati. Dankeschön. Um, uh, uh, ich wechsle jetzt ins Englische. Um, actually, I am here as a Vincent Heidegger Ersatz. Um, Vincent Heidegger um, was planning on being here tonight and um, to introduce his esteemed colleague, uh, Luca Caminati, um, but unfortunately could not be here. Um, and so he wrote an introduction and asked me to read it, which I will do. For Pierpaolo Pasolini, post-war Italian society, was marked by an unabashed triumph of consumerism. In his analysis, presented in a variety of writings across the last 15 years of his life, post-war consumerism achieved many of the same goals that fascism had set out to achieve, but had, un but had only incompletely realized. The transformation of a rich and variegated set of regional cultures into a homogenized nation state through the use of a uniform technocratic language and the propagation of uniform desires and aspirations, mostly through television. Pasolini's analysis, according to his detractors among his contemporaries, owed everything to a belated reception of the Frankfurt School, and particularly Marcuse's writings of the 1950s. Pasolini, some said, lacked any originality and could thus be resolutely dismissed. But, as is always the case with Pasolini, a thinker and artist who remains resolutely present and contemporary to our culture, while many of his critics have faded into oblivion, I don't think he means Marcuse, 
There is more to this critique of consumer society than meets the cursory glance. One of the ways in which he distinguishes himself from his contemporaries, and from the Frankfurt School for that matter, is in the way he thought about what was then commonly known as the third world, and in the way in which he turned the very concept of the third world into something rather different from the accepted meaning of the term. Rather than a so-called underdeveloped area of the world somewhere south and east of Europe, the third world for Pasolini started on the outskirts of Rome and took shape in the life of the Soto Proletariato, a radical alternative to bourgeois society and the processes of modernization. It extended from there to what is commonly known as the third world. The third world in Pasolini's sense was also a historical place, an inheritor and the inheritance of an ancient Mediterranean culture that never ceased to fascinate him. Part of which we heard last week in Massimo Fusiello's lecture. But most importantly, Pasolini's third world was a resource, an effective and intellectual resource, not a set of underdeveloped societies that needed to catch up with the West, but a counter model to consumer society that needed to be explored precisely because it could not be subsumed into a Western model of development and progress. Our guest tonight, Professor Luca Caminati from Concordia University in Montreal, wrote the book on Pierpaolo Pasolini's Third World. His monograph, with the wonderful title that Vincent would pronounce much better than I, Orientalissimo Eretico, Pierpaolo Pasolini e il Cinema del Terzo Mondo, from 2007, is the, work, is the work of reference on Pasolini's fascination with the Third World. Caminati is also one of the world's specialists on Pasolini's relationship with the visual arts, and particularly the art of his contemporaries in Italy in the 1960s and 70s. This was the subject of his second book, published bilingually. The English title is Cinema as Happening. Pasolini's Primitivism and the 60s Italian Art Scene, which was published in 2010. Shifting his attention to another grand figure of Italian post-war cinema and discovering new aspects to this person's work as well, Caminati's latest book, Roberto Rossellini, Documentarista, Una Cultura della Realtà, is a monograph on Rossellini's documentary films, which appeared in 2012. Professor Caminati earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and has been a professor of Italian and cinema studies at Colgate University before moving to Concordia University, one of the hubs of contemporary film studies and something that Vincent Heidegger doesn't even know, which I just learned. Um, professor Caminati also writes about fashion and club clubbing for Italian periodicals. Professor Caminati's lecture today is entitled Pasolini's Third World and deals with an unfinished documentary project, a number of uh, documentary projects, one of which entitled Notes Towards a Poem for the Third World from 1968. Luca Caminati will thus firmly train our eye for the first time in this series on a lesser known yet still vital part of Pasolini's work, his documentary films and we're thrilled that he accepted our invitation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kamenat. I was saying to Mark that he'll pay for that uh, comment later, later on. If you give me a second, I'm gonna put some water in my glass. So thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, uh, Mark, and thank all of you for coming. I know that you guys had many opportunities to be somewhere else tonight. So the fact that you decided to come here to watch some old black and white documentaries testify to the Frankfurt film culture. This is the first time that I'm speaking uh, in Frankfurt. So I'm extremely happy and, and particularly here at the Film Museum. 
Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to speak for 40, 45 minutes, and then there's going to be a pause, I think, and then a screening, and then there's going to be Q&A. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and, and, uh, and ask me. So last year, the a wonderful institution in Toronto called TIFF organized a retrospective not dissimilar from this called uh, Pasolini Poet of Contamination. And in the Q&A, one student asked me, what what is Pasolinesque? Um, so all of a sudden, when when this student asked me what Pasolinesque is, I started thinking what Felinesque is. So all of a sudden, I found myself unable to kind of answer. But I was on my way to Venice to the Biennale. So while I was there, I was looking at all the impressive Pasolinesque aspect of contemporary images. That is to say, it's uh, if we think of, and those of you who have been here are familiar, there are certain aspect of Pasolini's work. The, the space, for example, what uh, architects call terrain vague, that is to say that space between the city and the countryside. If you guys have seen Mama Roma and the early films, that suburban space is precisely where all Pasolini's early films live. Um, Another aspect of Pasolini, for example, is this engagement with the, a model that at the time was popular, the interview, the uh, kind of verite documentary a la Jean Rouge, um, that were very popular at the time. And uh, in particular in this uh, Chardonnay's uh, piece called uh, in Italian Ricerche, she titled it in Italian, she goes around uh, colleges in the United States asking questions to young women about sex. And f in, in a few weeks, you guys will have the opportunity to watch Comizzi d'Amore, which in English is Love Meetings, which is a wonderful film where Pasolini travels around the Italian peninsula asking uh, uh, people about their sex life, which is uh, quite an interesting experience. Um, in any case, um, so I think Richard Serra, is, Richard Serra is wrong when he built a coffin for Pasolini. Pasolini is not dead at all. In fact, the fact that you guys are here today is precisely a sign of this. Also, all over the uh, Europe and, uh, and North America, a retrospective on Pasolini are coming up. Uh, his presence in the art world is very visible. It's kind of interesting how every new generation rediscovers Pasolini. And I guess it was the same for me. I arrived to Pasolini through a very weird route. I arrived to it through post-colonial theory. And all of a sudden I realized that I had a wonderful example of a post-colonial thinker of sort. Uh, in my own background, and that's why I started. I started working on uh, on Pasolini. I'm gonna read a part of it, and I'm going to um, um, show you some slides. I decided not to show you any clips, uh, since you guys are going to watch the films it's themselves. I thought it was silly, <laughs> so I'm just gonna sort of give you a general introduction. Um, why was Pasolini making these films outside of Europe? What was his interest? What was the cultural atmosphere that surrounded Pasolini at the time and why was he making this film which as uh, Mark pointed out are, are kind of off a little bit apparently to his general production and by the way Vincent is wrong <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you why so Pasolini <laughs> Pasolini's travel outside of Europe began in January 1961 with a trip to India, undertaken in the company of best friends Alberto Moravia and Elsa Morante, two major figures of Italian culture of the time. His engagement with the known Western world, which Pasolini refused to ever define developing countries, both in praise and hope of their alterity to Western progress and as a clear acknowledgement of their political project was long and fruitful, producing two features film, Oedipus Rex and Arabian Nights, the documentaries and medium and short length film, Location Scouting in Palestine, which we're going to watch tonight, Notes for a Film on India, likewise, and Notes for an African Orestes, which I'm sure you can find on DVD and The Walls of Sana, which we're going to watch tonight, as well as the screenplay for an unrealized film titled The Savage Father, Il Padre Selvaggio. In addition to these completed works, 
was the large and ambitious unrealized project of uh, notes for a poem on the third world, uh, Appunti per un poema sul terzo mondo, of which notes for a film of in, on India and location scouting were supposed to be part. So when Pasolini moved to Rome from Friuli, the northeastern part of Italy where he spent a large portion of, the, of his youth and whose dialect he co-opted for his first poems, he claimed that it was the discovery of the elsewhere, la scoperta dell'altrove, that drove him towards the early realist novels and the first realist quote-unquote films. So it is the discovery of a different elsewhere that would push him outside of the West and the Western canon. Like many other engaged artists of late modernity, Pasolini was witness to a radical change. The other and alterity were no longer only identified with the proletariat, the sotto proletariato that you mentioned, and the working class, but with the quote unquote cultural other, that is to say the non-Westerner or the marginalized. Um, this change from a subject defined in terms of economic relation to one defined in terms of cultural identity is significant in as much as it forces the committed artist to move beyond national borders, to explore new expressive forms, and above all, to turn to other disciplines such as anthropology, sociology, and ethnography in order to conduct his creative work. This engagement with the third world what in my book I called Heretical Orientalism, which is a pun on a book of essays by Pasolini called Heretical Empiricism, um, his collection of essays on Marxist, or a Marxist reading of Italian culture, is neither a naive Orientalist vision of the East, nor a mere reproduction of the classical Marxist position on the revolutionary potential of the underdeveloped peoples, as theorized by Lenin and, Trons and Trotsky, which frame the people stuck in pre-capitalist life as in need of developing through capitalism to socialism in a strict teleological vision of the revolutionary project. Um, if you are interested in this specific moment of Italian culture, reading the two books written by Moravia and Pasolini in India, one titled Scent of India, the other The Idea of India, show precisely these two models. Moravia was a more strict Marxist, truly believed that underdeveloped countries had to become first capitalist bourgeois in order to move on to a socialist revolution. Pasolini never believed in that strict teleological movement, and I hope tonight I can show you how and why. So my analysis today of Pasolini's third, third worldism, uh, tiermondisme as the French call it, aims at filling a gap in both Pasolini's studies and in post-colonial studies in the Italian context. It has been easy to accuse Pasolini from his first reportage, The Scent of India, and on, of an orientalizing attitude and chastise him so as to delight the new censor of postcolonial ethics. And it is true that, uh, particularly those of you who have seen Arab Nights, it's very easy to, <laughs> to sort of mark Pasolini as the classic Western white guy traveling through. Uh, darker countries. Um, as Cesare Casarino, who will be speaking here at the end of in May, I think, and I strongly recommend you to come see him, wrote, I'm quoting, a mere critique of Pasolini's Orientalism is an insufficient and inadequate hermeneutical gesture in and of itself. So why is inadequate and insufficient? Because like few others, Pasolini so clearly through the fog of the parochial and ultra-conformist Italy of the 50s and 60s, the need of a possible alternative to neo-capital in Western model, of a real and profound alterity, of which he felt himself to be an actualization. And this is, um, Vincent here is right. He really saw a resource, a reservoir of possibility in this space sitting outside of the Western capital. He himself, obviously, was a, 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 somebody who sat in between different spaces. He was a communist expelled from the party. For those of you who don't know the story, he was a young man in his early 20s teaching elementary school in Friuli, which is the part of Italy now close to the Slovenia, to the Slovenian border. And he was caught uh, in the bushes jerking off with some kids and the carabinieri brought him back and they asked him, what are you doing? And, he, and apparently he said, we were experimenting with André Gide. 
But that didn't didn't work to get him out of prison. In fact, he was expelled from the Communist Party for immoral acts, as it was called. But he was also a homosexual, not taking part in the gay movement. And in fact, if you look at your program, my colleague Tom Wall, who will be speaking here next week, there is a question mark at the end of his title, Queer Pasolini. And I hope that you guys are going to tell me if he actually claims that Pasolini is, is a queer representative, because then he would be really lying to you, I think. <laughs> So it was also a polemicist against both the mainstream and the alternatives. As you know, he was always taking the quote unquote wrong position in history. To give you a Pasolini example, during the old Je suis Charlie extravaganza that happened also where I live in Quebec, which is very much connected to France culturally, linguistically, there was a bit of a short lived movement called Je suis Ahmed. Ahmed was the policeman killed right outside of the Charlie Hebdo. And uh, for those of you who know this, Pasolini took the position of the cops, of the police during the 1968 movement in the sense that he claimed that the, the, the students were the son of rich people playing revolution, while the one that were real working class were the cops who were the sons of immigrants from the South who had to watch this long hair uh, people um, ruined the city of Rome. So that Je suis Ahmed was a real Pasolinian moment, if you like. So going back to my talk, um, in this talk, I'm not going to neither condemn nor celebrate Pasolini. And um, there is a whole stream of scholars that refer to Pasolini with first name, usually people that have never met him, and they usually refer to him as Pierpaolo. Funny enough, the people who knew him and talk about him now always refer to him as Pasolini. So there is a bizarre fetishization of Pasolini. So I'm not here to do that, and I'm not he here to um, I'm here to arrive at an understanding of the way in which one of the keenest Italian intellectuals of his time positioned in himself in relation to the Third World to then, through Pasolini, investigate the nascent globalization from an Italian perspective. So I'm not here to, to write an hagiography of Saint Pasolini, of Saint Paul, Saint Pier Paul Pasolini, as seems very common nowadays. Um, I'm just going to give you one example. There is a book by Giuseppe Zigania called Pasolini e la morte, Pasolini and death, which hopefully will never be translated in German or in English. It, uh, Zigania was a friend of Pasolini from his Friulian days. He's a figurative painter from the from um, this the, had some sort of career in the 60s and 70s. He came out with this book in which he claims that Pasolini structured his death, planned his death by deciding to be killed on November 2nd, which is uh, Day of the Dead in Italy, to be killed in Ostia, which uh, Ostia in Italy, it's, this little, it's a little town outside of Rome where Pasolini was killed, but it means that it's the wafer that the Catholic priests hand out to the believers, right? So basically that Pasolini orchestrated his death. Some sort of, I'm trying to think which Hitchcockian character uh, Pasolini is thought to be to sort of orchestrate massively. I'm thinking of uh, maybe um, a Finchner, sort of minor Finchner film, never realized project. In any case, um, it seems to me very important to understand the contradiction and the problem of Pasolini. I don't think the study in an auteur means to sort of praise and write in a geography. It means to uh, look at them symptomatically. That is to say, look at Pasolini as a symptom of a larger trend. So, um, following what uh, Edward Said wrote in Culture and, and Imperialism about Jean Genet, Pasolini has to be considered, in my opinion, an integral part of the literature of decolonization, alongside Aimé César, Édouard Glissant, and Franz Fanon. Specifically, and here we can see both the strengths and weaknesses of Pasolini Third Worldism, he was involved throughout the 50s and 60s in articulating a I call it transnationally, transnational revolutionary universalism. And I try to explain what I mean. This understanding of the third world struggle in a non-identitarian manner is how Said read Fanon. That is to say, there's been a rethinking at the moment itself, that is to say, already in the 60s, 
of all the struggle and particularly the thinkings that located the ideology of the struggle in whether it was a negritude as Amy Cesar did or uh, uh, white mask, uh, black mask, white faces, uh, the way in which Fanon reads the Algerian revolution racially. There's been uh, from the very beginning a, let's call it universalization or a non identitarization of that by Western intellectuals. And uh, for those of you who are in, more interested in the Italian situation, it's interesting to look at a journal called Quaderni Piacentini, which was the real alternative to the traditional uh, Communist Party uh, uh, publications. In, in these journals, we can see from for at the very beginning how the myth of negritude, as it was called, is dismissed. And the struggle of third world liberation movement was seen in a more general uh, sort of atmosphere. For example, poet Giovanni Giudici and Marxist intellectually write that uh, Giudici attempt to normalize Fanon as part of the, quote, global battle always already in place to the liberation of men. Hmm? So this transnationally revolutionary fervor is well captured by Pasolini in one of his poems. It's called Prophecia, Prophecy, dedicated to Jean-Paul Sartre. So Pasolini wrote, years ago, I dreamt of the peasants coming up from Africa with a Lenin flag, take up the Calabrians and march west together. So this idea that the liberation struggle was precisely the space of possibility where the new world, where the revolution would happen. But of course, in order for that to happen, it had to be de-racialized in a way, or de-identitarized. And this is what happens already prepared for Pasolini by the, let's say, alternative to the traditional Communist Party vision. So... Here, Pasolini is taking a very heretical geopolitical stance. He aligns himself with a new tradition of Italian intellectuals, grouped mostly around this journal, Quaderni Piacentini, that aimed at breaking away from the Italian Communist Party allegiance with the USSR, USSR and its strict doctrine of geopolitical bipolarism. The Communist, Italian Communist Party was, of course, bound to a, to uh, 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 an alliance with the USSR Communist Party and therefore all never took side or had serious problem in looking at the revolutionary struggle in Africa at the time where it not filter through the USSR, uh, the Russian press or the Soviet press. So Pasolini was opening up the movement to the non-aligned countries born out of the Bandung Conference of 1955, where the first non-aligned countries conference happened, and the urgency of the anti-colonial movement in Africa. It does not come as a surprise that in 1968 he, defend, he defined himself as the as a intellettuale fanoniano marcusiano, so a fanonian marcusian intellectual. So. If you want to ask uh, about Marcuse, Mark about Marcuse, he'll take care of that part of the sentence. I'm going to talk about the Fanonian, the Fanonian part. But you can see here how already this small sentence in in Fanonian Marcusean intellects will bring together very separate world. On the one hand, Franz Fanon, Martinique-born um, intellectual and at the core of the Algerian uh, liberation movement against uh, French uh, colonialism. On the other, Marcuse, therefore the European Fr uh, Freud, Marx, uh, media conglomerate on the one side. Hmm? So I also I believe that it is in following this interpretative line, and this is going to be very important for our films, that much of the presumed contradiction concerning Pasolini and religion find a possible reconciliation. Those of you who have seen the film have noticed that Pasolini is obsessed with Catholic imagery, but there's also some sort of dialogue with the Catholic Church. I claim that uh, the revolution brought about by the short papacy of John 23rd, which goes from 58 to 63, open up the Catholic Church to, quote-unquote, all men of goodwill, as the Pope put it. That included an opening to the thought to the of the left, in particular to the anti-colonial struggle, 
I am, as I'm now currently working on a larger project on the influence of the third world liberation movements in Italian cinema and art in the 60s, I found myself spending a lot of time in archives run by friars and priest congregation. That is to say, the one that somehow got around the bipolarism of the USA versus USSR were precisely these Catholic groups, the, the left-leaning Catholic group of post-Vatican II that managed and sometimes had very, very um, uh, strict and tight involvement in liberation struggles. I found some interesting pictures of friars with machine guns that... I'm going to publish one day. Um, so, um, and this is going to be interesting to understand our first film, So Prologue in Palestina, Location Scouting in, uh, in Palestina. So let me tell you a little bit about this form, this genre that Pasolini called appunti, uh, notes, uh, notizen in German, right? Notizen, yeah. So Pasolini first experiment with what would become a new way of making films a bizarre combination of voiceover, non-fictional documentation, reenactment, musical adaptation, and everything else that we go under the general heading of appunti, notes, was carried out during his first trip to Palestine in 1964, and this is going to be, I think, the first film. While he was in Palestine, in search of locations for the Gospel, Il Vangelo, the Gospel according to Matthew, from June 27 to July 1st, 1963, a cameraman and two priests from a group called Pro Civitate Cristiana, a group, uh, one of precisely one of these left-leaning groups, uh, post-Vatican II production, uh, still in existence in Assisi, um, with whom association with, with with priests with whom he had been in in contact in dialogue for some years, so. After this shooting, this location scouting, um, Pasolini came back to Rome and decided to add an off-screen, create a kind of travel diary, basically, that's what it is, that included conversation recording during the trip. The central theme of location scouting is very simple. The modernity of the landscape did not lend, lend itself to be used for the shooting of the film. Very simple. Too many modern stuff, too many cars, too many electric poles, it didn't work out. So much so, Pasolini ended up shooting the film in southern Italy in a town called Matera, um, which we can talk about the contradiction of finding the third world in southern Italy, maybe uh, later. So one can see how the future development of Pasolini's other documentaries production in the years to come uh, would be an elaboration of the first experiment. And as I said, for example, Comizio d'Amore, Love Meetings, which will be screened here in a few, few weeks, um, is an elaboration of it, and obviously under the influence of Jean Rouch and Edgar Morin's films that were circulating at the time uh, in Europe. I'm thinking of Chronicle of a Summer, Chronique d'un été, for, for example. So, Pasolini was so attracted to this filmic practice, the appunti, the notes, as to develop a project for a full-length film that would have been entitled Notes for a Poem on the Third World, made up of five episodes from the notes series to be filmed in India, Africa, the Arab countries, as he called it, I'm quoting from his notes, Latin America, and the black ghettos of the United States. In addition to their practical purpose, to find locations suited to his films, there were ideological and political motives behind this project. So as Pasolini explains, um, this is uh, Pasolini in, uh, in Palestine with the Don Mazzi, the priest that was accompanied. You will see there are this bizarre moment in which uh, Pasolini actually addresses the audience uh, during the, the shooting of the film. So this is a long quote, so I decided to put it up. For, this is uh, how Pasolini uh, theorize this this project, this film, Notes for a Poem on the Third World. The film of the film will be violent, violently and even full-heartedly revolutionary. As thou to make of other film itself a revolutionary action, not related to any political party, of course, and absolutely independent. The immense quantity of practical, ideological, sociological, and political material that goes into constructing such a film objectively prevents the manipulation of a normal film. This film will thus follow the formula, a film on a film to be made. 
Each episode will be composed of a story narrated with a summary and through the most salient and dramatic scenes and by preparatory sequences for the story itself, interviews, investigation, documentaries. Stylistically, the film will be composite, complex and spurious, but the stark clarity of the problems treated and its function as a direct evolutionary intervention will simplify it. So, <clears throat> where does this idea come from? Where does the theory and praxis of the notes uh, come from? That is to say, who was Pasolini in dialogue here with? I claim that I believe Pasolini was responding here to a general cultural trend of the time in the early 60s. The choice of the notes resonated with experimental linguistic forms, what Umberto Eco called the open work in, the, in his eponymous 1962 volume, uh, Open Work. This is the Umberto Eco pre-semiotics, uh, uh, pre right? Open works, in Eco's words, are, quote, those that must be brought to conclusion by the interpreter at the very moment at which he benefits from them aesthetically. Hmm? So, uh, Pasolini has a way of rethinking the idea of open work. He calls it struttura da farsi, structure that has to be done, or structure that has to be completed. So the da farsi, the structure that has to be completed, represents for Pasolini more than a simple unfinished. It is related to the necessity of creating a work with a fluid structure that reflects on one hand the Marxist socio-political vision of the da farsi society, the, the society that has to be made. This is particularly useful if one thinks of the notion of Marxist praxis and its importance at the moment of transi a transition to the structuring of a democratic state, and it was happening in many African countries in the 60s. Also, it resonates with what Eco, Umberto Eco, referring to Brecht theater, calls revolutionary pedagogy. Eco so clarifies the revolutionary pedagogy of the open war, quote, it is the same concrete ambiguity of social existence as a clash of unresolved problems to which it is necessary to find a solution. The work here is open, as a debate is open. The solution is awaited and hoped for, but it must come from the conscious participation of the public. Hmm? So what I'm claiming here is that <clears throat> the idea of nodes come from a specific Marxist culture of the keeping the debate open in the same way in which the, we keep the work of art open, in the same way, we, way in which we keep the society open. It is precisely the reservoir of possibility that uh, Mark was mentioning in his introduction. The, um, the Pasolinian pedag pedagogy, which we see also in the quote, is never didacticism, but the demonstration of a process of a da farsi that has to be made. And the self-reflexivity of the notes, and you'll notice that in these films there is a constant back and forth between the actual making of the film, the thinking about the film, the meta and the film overlap uh, constantly. So what we have in this film is not a documentary on Africa, India, Palestine, Sana, but a film on a film for hmm, Africa and India. So it is only thus that the direct revolutionary intervention that Pasolini places at the base of his notes for a poem on the Third World Project, transform itself from colonial narrative into an open uh, linguistic and philosophical and philosophical experience. <clears throat> so, um, I'm, since we are watching the films, I decided that I'm going to sort of give you a, a more general introduction, and I, I noticed that I have 15 minutes left. Uh, of my 45, 45 minutes. Let me say a few few general things about uh, uh, a few extra, maybe a few extra steps that, that we can take from that uh, from that point. So, the trip to India, which is going to be, I think, the second film you guys are going to watch, Notes for a Film on India, um, it's very typical of this Apunti genre, with the mixture of off-screen, on-screen, voiceover, interviews, interviews with journalists, interviews with people in the street, um, but um, even stylistically, you can see uh, 
the, the, the combination of ideology and style, would, I'm gonna, just going to talk about one scene that I particularly like in Notes for a Film of India. And it's a moment right in the middle of the film where it's a camera car. It's a shot from a camera moving along a, a, an, um, a pipeline, a oil pipeline, in which Pasolini tells you a kind of a brief summary of Indian history. But the images become all of a sudden completely bur blurred. That is to say, it is very clear that every time Pasolini becomes, he realizes that he's becoming too didactic, or, and all of a sudden the images seems to interfere with the voiceover. And you notice also the other way around. It is very clear that Pasolini wants to keep this structure extremely open, that they don't want to be manifesto on something, that he doesn't want to tell you the story. Um, obviously, uh, this w will have an effect uh, on how you as spectator react and experience this kind of films. They are very time-based, that is to say, watching this film in 1968 I'm sure had a very different effect from watching it now. That is to say, the event that he talks about were very present to the audiences at the time. So he was speaking almost as a journalist in this, uh, in this morning. Uh, he was really speaking about events that were happening right at that, uh, right at that moment. Of all the films we are watching tonight, the most interesting, I think, it's most bizarre, is this film called The Walls of Sana, Le Mura di Sana. Um, and Sana is actually back in the news this day because of the current events. So let me tell you a little bit about this film. It was shot in 1970. Um, bec and funny enough, Pasolini and his crew were there because they had just finished shooting an episode of Dede Cameron, an, an episode called Ali Back. The episode never found his spot in the camera, so the scene was cut. But while he was there, he realized something that he had never thought about before, that he could actually use the camera uh, to write a documentary in the form of an appeal to UNESCO. This is how he... Um, he calls the film. So Sana is crumbling, like, quote, um, quoting Pasolini, like Prague, Amsterdam, Urbino must be saved from himself. The inhabitants of the city have perpetrated the crime in a desperate desire for modernization. So the documentary quickly focuses on all the institutions of the country, the Minister of Public Education, the Palace, the Central Bank. It isn't clear if these buildings are already halfway built or dilapidated. Much like at the beginning of Notes for a Film of India, which you guys are going to see, Pasolini eye dwells on the, at the beginning of his films upon state apparatuses, as though to pose a question, if not directly posing a challenge, to those who are responsible for what they see, what we see. This engaged, but also clearly sarcastic gazing foregrounds immediately the main problem of Pasolinian ideology at the moment in which it enters into contact with the alterity of decolonization and the third world. The effects of modernity and technological progress on the pre-industrial -industri world with all of the contradiction of which Pasolini is profoundly aware. So the argument of Wolosana is this, to help, help these young nations to realize the absolute value of their artistic and historical heritage. And you understand obviously the immense contradiction of this, where you have the neo-capitalist West uh, should halt the process of industri industrial modernization and thus help the third world become conscious of its own unique alterity. Um, but this kind of contradiction, the, the idea of teaching the, the people of Sana to understand their cultural heritage was not something that Pasolini was afraid. So in this film, he, rely, he relies on a trick that he does quite often, which we might call comparative anthropologies. That is to say, he started talking about something back home. So all of a sudden, this film, The Walls of Sana, switched to something else, uh, a short documentary on the city of Orte. Orte is uh, right outside of Rome. If you ever taken the Florence-Roma uh, highway, you can actually see right up on the hill. It's a small town on the Tiber Valley, not far from Rome. So these images are shot during the filming of another short, short film, which was an interview that Pasolini did for Italian television. He decides to bring them together and compare the city of Orte and the uh, city of Sana in Yemen. And he says, at this moment, this is the voiceover of the film, that the, the destruction of the ancient world, that is the real world, 
is taking place everywhere. And reality, l'irrealtà, he calls it, spreads by way of the housing speculation of neo-capitalism. In place of the beautiful and human Italy, even if poor, there is now something indefinable that to call ugly is to say little. So, all of a sudden, we understand that for Pasolini, the third world is precisely the space where he can think outside of his own country, about his own country. It's a way of looking back. And there is this constant comparative uh, spirit. And you'll see this uh, throughout the three films that you guys are going to watch tonight. There's always this idea of using what he sees out there to talk about what's happening, what's happening back there. In fact, in the walls of Sana, he says... Italy is a laboratory country because in it the modern industrial world and the third world coexist. Hmm? What I was saying about shooting in Matera. There is no difference between a Calabrian village and an Indian or Moroccan village. It is a question of two variants of a single fact that at the bottom is the same. So... I'm, I'm, I made two claims up to now. The first claim is the fact that Pasolini has to be fought in the line of European intellectuals engaged in the third world struggle. And I put it in the same category of Aimé César and Franz Fanon um, and, uh, and other, and Edouard Glissant. And I understand that this is a bit of a, a bit of a stretch. But I'm saying that by looking at Pasolini through this lens, even the films that are not directly related to the third world will acquire, I believe, a, a different, a different meaning. The second claim I'm making tonight is that he was using this form of the appunti, the notes, as an open form that was very much in, already in place and it was very popular all over Europe. That is to say, the idea of the work of art as a participatory effort. Um, one of the sentences that the book I wrote called Cinema is Happening is, is a sentence from Pasolini himself in which he, he actually talks about the experience of going to the cinema not as a passive viewer but as being in a happening you know in the 60s 70s it was very popular to have these performing arts pieces where the audience was involved mm -hmm. um, so the idea for Pasolini was to transform the cinematic experience in a happening, that is to say, in some sort of performative moment where the audience was, was participating. The third point I, wanna, I want to make has to do with the specificity of cinema. That is to say, the fact that all that he is trying to do here could have happened only, only, uh, through the means of cinema and the way in which Pasolini conceived of cinema. So this is my uh, last quote and I hope I'm not going to bore you, but I think it's kind of interesting. So Pasolini writes this in Sana, in his diary, why is this shooting? And he says, nothing compels one to look at things like making a film. The gaze of a writer upon a landscape, rural or urban, can exclude an infinity of things, cutting out from the whole only those that give rise to emotion or serve some purpose. The gaze of a director on this same landscape, meanwhile, cannot fail to take note of, almost list in them, all the things that are found there. Indeed, while for a writer, things are destined to become words, I hope there are not many writers today here, that is, symbols in the expression of a director, things remain things, the signs of the verbal system are thus symbolic and conventional, while the signs of the cinematographic system are precisely the things themselves, in the materiality and their reality. This become, it is true, signs, but they are living signs, so to speak, of themselves. Those of you who are familiar with Pasolini toying and playing with semiotics know that he had this... Uh, old theory develop on cinema as the written language of reality, the fact that the camera by itself, uh, by its own nature, ontologically, we would have said some years ago, uh, capture reality as is. So if I had gone to Yemen and Sana as a writer, Pasolini continues, I would have returned with a completely different idea of Yemen than that which I have having gone there as a director. 
I don't know which of the two is more true. As a writer, I would have returned with the idea, exciting and static, of a country crystallized in a medieval historical situation with tall and narrow red houses decorated with wide friezes as though made by a crude goldsmith, heaped up in the middle of a burning desert and bright enough to scratch the cornea, the cornea of the eye. And here and there, valleys with villages that repeat exactly the architectural form of the city among sparse terrace garden of wheat, of barley, or small vines. He's not a bad writer, after all. As a director, I saw instead, in the middle of all this, the expressive, horrible presence of modernity. A leprosy of chaotically planted light posts, houses of cement and sheet metal, built without sense there were the walls of the city once were, public buildings in a dreadful 20th century Arab style. And naturally my eyes had to rest themselves on other things as well, smaller or even minuscule, plastic objects. Any of us who have traveled in the third world live with this image of the plastic bags, which should be the flag of the known Western world at this point, right? And uh, he talks about the plastic object, cans, shoes, textile of cotton, can pears from China, little radios. I saw, in short, concludes Pasolini, the coexistence of two semantically different worlds, united in a single chaotic expressive system. So, the third point I want to make tonight is that this research in the third world for Pasolini had to happen, had to happen through the camera. In the sense that um, the fight that Pasolini was carrying was on two levels. It was a political fight for liberation movement, but it was also an ideological fight on uh, against television and against media. So... This world that he uses, irrealta, unreality, what, do, what does Pasolini mean by it? For him, ir, unreality, irrealta, is the new neo-capitalist world of uh, audiovisual media presented as non-ideological. It's very similar as a concept to what Guy Debord, precisely at the same time in 1968, called La Société du Spectacle, the Society of Spectacle, right? So... In fact, in one of his essays in Heretical Empiricism, Pasolini uh, almost uh, order, we must deontologize, we must ideologize. That is to say, we must stop. Uh, it, this is an appeal to battle the unreality of the flattening representation of the then nascent society of the spectacle, which directly acts, uh, and this is the Gramscian aspect, of Pasolini, um, directly acts in an inversion of the relation with his basin structure on the world of reality. That is to say, the battle that he wants to fight is precisely the battle of the flattening, the de-ideologization <laughs> of images, right? And these films, in their open form, in their engagement with the reality of the third world, want to be precisely manifestos for the third world, that is to say, in favor of the struggle, but also um, against the, that world that Pasolini saw, that modernity that uh, in one of his writings he calls the anthropological mutation, right? That is to say, he was actually saying that the new world of media, the, the, in the new world of media, this, uh, uh, my time is over, uh, in this world of media, um, um, I lost my train of thought, but I'll get back to it. Um, the um, the idea that images ha have no ideology. Hmm? This is exactly up So I hope that tonight you're going to, I think, have a good time. These, these films are actually funny, I think. They're actually enjoyable. They're odd. They're kind of bizarre objects, but I think they're very interesting and very useful. And also, for those of you who are interested in document, in experimental documentary, I'm sure that I can see an MA thesis here, maybe working on Chris Marker, Trinity Minha, James Clifford. Um, so for students out there that are looking for a good paper, a good topic, I think this, uh, this would work. So I want to thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm looking forward to your questions.